Mai Hawaii ki Hawaii nui, Hawaii poko, Hawaii loa. Mai Hawaii nui a kea, a hiki loa aku i ka aina o nga oivi o maleka. Ka aina, ho'o heno heno, i kapa ia o Turtle Island. He aloha ke ia ia o koula. Apela no ho'i ko o aloha i nga hoa maka maka o nga moku like ole o ka hou nua nei. Me o kou ka velina o ko o aloha. Ua mana o ia, he wā ke ia e pono ai ka ho'okua no'o ana i ka ho'ola kanaka, ka ho'ola lāhui, a me ka ho'ola honua. Pe ia no ho'i ka maluhia mai kahi kapa o ka honua, ai ke ka kai ho'honu o ka moana lipo-lipo, ai i nga kolono, a me ke ka niolo o nga mauna ki e ki e, o ka honua nei. No leila, e au ke pule nei. E nga kua nga o mā kua nga kūpuna au hea o kou. E ia no mā kou nga mamo, nga ka vovo a o kou. E la ala nga e nei i kou mā kou leo mahalo, no nga pō mai kai o ke ia no hana. Ke no noe aku nei mā kou i ka pā hola mau o ke aloha, a me ka maluhia ma ka aina nei. E kōkua mai, a e kāko o mai i i kai ka mako, i loko ka veli o nga hua o lelo a mako e lohe ai, ka makau o nga koho e ho'oholo ai, ka eha a mako e kā mau ai, ka inea e ike i a nei ma ka honua, ma ke kai a ulu a pela wale aku. E oki a ho'o ka a wale i aku, Ka hopohopo ka naau, na pōpilikia, ka eha eha o loko, a mena hema hema o mākou kanaka. E ho olu olu i ka moku moku a hua o ka naau luu luu o nga o hana. E ho o mālama lama i a ko mākou mau mana o, me ka oia i o. E ho mai i ka vivo ole, a me ka naau au i a mākou nei. I ke ia wā pūpū a hulu o ka honua. E hō mai i ka hōpū kahi. E kūkulu ia he pūpū honua no mākou. O iai, nga o kou no mākou e pale, e mālama, e alakai, e ola. E ke a kua mana loa, a me nga kūpuna hiva hiva. Ka mea i kūlia i ka nuu, a kū i ka nio. Ke ho'o mai ka i aku nei no mākou i ko o kou i noa me ka o kou mau hana nui. E olu olu, e ho'o mai ka malu a me ke aloha nui. I ola mākou me ka pono, ka na awao a me ke aloha. A mama, ua noa. Aloha mai noa kākou. As we gather today via digital platforms, we encourage everyone to acknowledge the unceded lands and territories that we currently dwell upon and the indigenous peoples of those lands. During these times, these unprecedented times, it's crucial for us as Kanaka Maoli, Pacific Islanders, Asians, Latinx, Black and indigenous peoples, to draw upon our collective spirit and strength to set our intentions. We recognize that we descend from cultures that value our land bases and see life in all aspects of our environment. We cherish our elders and ancestors, as well as their wisdom, ways of knowing and practices. These values are our collective strength and spirit that we invoke to dismantle the systemic racism and oppressive structures that we encounter and navigate daily. Eoni pa'akako. We must be steadfast in our intentions and strategic moment, movements. Steadfast in our solidarity. We thank you for the honor of your time today. This episode is a moment in transition where return to the source which was focused on the upcoming Kata Confess, will pivot into a new series of episodes responding 
to the rise of anti-Asian hate across America. I'd like to call upon Leilani Chan, my co-chair for the 2022 CONFESS, to share her thoughts and orient us here today. Mahalo for that, Haile Okua. Uh, we transitioned to this virtual series last year when it became clear that we could not gather in person due to the pandemic. We wanted this series to begin a conversation that may, to begin conversations that may have otherwise happened in person last summer in Hawaii at CONFEST. This series has since become a place to check in with our community and colleagues and to address the times. From George, from George Floyd's murder in Minneapolis to the murders of eight Asian women in Atlanta last month, to the mur murder of I Remember Saikap, a 16-year-old Chukis boy in Hawaii by the Honolulu police by an Honolulu police officer and yesterday's police shooting of 20-year-old Dante Wright in the Twin Cities once again. Our hearts go out to all of you. It has been a lot. It has been a year of keeping our families safe while mourning our friends and relatives who have passed from COVID-19. This monthly grounding and conversation with each other and with you has been a lifeline for myself, the Kata board, membership, and I hope for you, the viewer as well. A way to combat isolation and find community, even if only online. Even if to sit in the sadness and anger together as we process, transition, and pivot. I keep asking, how can we use this in our work? But in many ways, it is too soon to know. As my dear friend and Tierra board member, Diane Burby, has said to me, we are all the walking wounded. We need to be gentle with ourselves and each other and set our intention for healing and understanding across clans, tribes, ethnicities, and color lines, which makes me so pleased to be part of this announcement that under the leadership of Kata's board president, Leslie Ishii, and vice president, KT Shore, Kata will be transitioning to this virtual, transitioning this virtual series, Return to the Source, to Healing Over Hate. And, and we gladly pass the, the baton in support. Yes, Haile? <laughs> Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. <laughs> uh, we had hoped that we would be able to see all of you in person in Honolulu for the National Asian American Theater Conference and Festival next month. However, as you all know, it is still too soon to gather in person. And we feel strongly that we want to make sure that we keep both the residents of Hawaii safe, as well as our visitors. And we want our gathering to be big. So contest will take place in May 2022. Make the change in your calendar. Be sure to become a Kata member and like Kata on Facebook and all the social media platforms. And Haile Opua and I will be back uh, whenever we have updates for you on the many details so you can plan your trip to be with us all together uh, with and we will be back with definitive information as we are able to share it i <laughs> yes uh, <laughs> any other thoughts Heidi, before we pass it on um take care be safe stay healthy um holistically healthy so that we can convene and the time will come when when we'll be able to welcome everybody here in Hawaii. And with that, we'd love to bring on Leslie to, to begin this episode. Oh, thank you so much. Beth. And they're not going too far, y'all. They'll be back in the program in a little bit. So but thank you for your leadership and thank you for that moving and important blessing and acknowledgement to bring us into right purpose, into intention for this series and beyond. Um, thank you. Uh -huh. um, also, a hello to our partners, HowlRound Theater Commons and their HowlRound TV platform uh, for their support and renewing with Kata, this partnership to bring this series 
healing over hate, responding to, as uh, Leilani mentioned, responding to the rise in anti-Asian violence, so important. And as you see here on the screen, we'll circle back to this as well, but our wonderful, all of our wonderful uh, foundational support and organizational support. And of course, um, we, we, as Leilani mentioned, uh, we always welcome your donations, your support, and do become a member. Um, with that, I can share with you that here at Kata, we wanted to use our platform, our leadership, our privilege that we have in being able to be virtual and to have our organization of Consortium Asian American Theaters and Artists um, for our theater sector and beyond, for our family, relatives, all of you, our communities, to support our Asian Pacifica, Pacific Islander, Native, Indigenous, Middle Eastern, North African communities to heal and be empowered during these really difficult times. And we also want to be sure that we are bringing awareness so that our non-AAPI colleagues and artists can educate themselves to join us in condemning and activating anti, uh, uh, activating support against anti-Asian hate and violence and anti-Blackness and anti-Indigeneity. So, with that, today's program will begin with this opportunity for us to self-educate so that we can deepen our learning cross-culturally, cross-racially. In other words, build our own analysis. And we have the great honor and fortune of KT Shorb, our vice president, who will offer a very illuminating presentation regarding the history of anti-Asian hate and violence. And then we'll be bringing forth in order to make sure we wanted to do our part so that we break isolation, support our communities with resources during this traumatic time. Uh, so in order to help us with that, we will welcome on family therapist, clinical counselor, Ginger Clee, to join us with um, an important and wonderful presentation as well. So uh, with that, after that, we'll follow with questions. And if you want to ask questions anonymously, please on Facebook, please find Ariel Estrada. Uh, Ariel's name is A-R-I-E-L and last name E-S-T-R-A-D-A at Ariel's Facebook Messenger. Again, you can uh, offer a question anonymously and Ariel will relay that to us. Or if you're on Facebook or HowlRound's channel, you can utilize the chat function there because <clears throat> we're live streaming there. So just know one of our priorities is to not only support with these uh, important presentations so we can all keep our learning moving forward to work together cross-racially, cross-culturally, but also to hear from you, to be able to support you in the conversations that are relevant to you today. So with that, I don't want to wait. I don't want to uh, delay us any longer. Uh, it's my deepest gratitude for the service of KT Shorb, who contributes to Kata as the vice president of the board. And um, KT is also the producing artistic director of Generic Ensemble Theater Company. And this fall, uh, we congratulate KT as they will be joining the Department of Communication, Film, and Theater at Allegheny College as Assistant Professor of Acting and Directing. Congratulations to UKT on that new position. And so please, please join me in offering a warm virtual welcome to KT Shore. Thank you for joining us today, KT. I will leave you now to share your presentation and I'll be back soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Leslie. Uh, I'm here to, uh, offer a very brief, very brief uh, history of anti-Asian hatred in the United States as it is related to both disease and gender representation. So ever since the pe people of Asian descent came to the United States, we have been associated with infection and invasion. First coming to the fore in the form of anti-Asian sentiment against Chinese enclaves, Asian people began to symbolize degeneracy and squalor through depictions of opium addiction. 
Chinese immigrants became associated with smallpox, plague, and STIs. Angel Island, the point of entry for all Asian America immigrants, became a major health checkpoint. This idea of Chinese as other bodies, as contagions, led to the Chinese Exclu Exclusion Act, which was the first act to exclude people from the United States based on race. The Chinese Exclusion Act led the way for numerous other exclusionary laws and practices aimed at immigrants from Asia. This general anxiety about infection and invasion from Asia was personified in the Yellow Peril, an insatiable feckless caricature symbol of the Orient, who was hellbent on taking over decent American soil with its inscrutable and calculating ways. The Yellow Peril has been equally concomitant with its counterpart, the model minority myth. The model minority myth has been a racial wedge that simultaneously renders invisible the economic and social struggles of working class and refugee Asian Americans, while also delegitimizes claims made specifically by the Black community about racism in the United States. Meanwhile, this orientalizing gaze has led to dichotomies in gender portrayal. Women of Asian descent are portrayed as either subservient lotus blossoms or villainous and sinful dragon ladies, both to fulfill the exoticized sexual fantasies of white men. And this is, these are both images of Anna Mae Wong. And men of Asian descent are either feckless criminals trying to corrupt blonde white women or are acting as obedient domestics doing quote unquote women's work, work women's work. They, in these depictions, they are deemed sexually castrated and impotent. In both men and women, they are either evil villains or good, dutiful acolytes with no nuance or room for multiple dimensions. This dichotomy between evil and good Asian plays out in health as Asian bodies become seen as evil contagions versus good, important, and often colonial care. Whether as diseased opium addicts wanting to colonize California or as Filipino Florence Nightingale, Asian Americans have often been seen in close proximity to health. Our association with disease periodically returns. Swine flu, bird flu and SARS are just some recent examples where disease too readily becomes associated with Asianness. The most recent, of course, being COVID-19. Touted as the Chinese virus or Kung flu by our own seditious former president, and this is in fact Trump's very own notes for a speech that he gave, Rather than taking steps to limit the spread of a much anticipated pandemic, white supremacists have taken aim at people of Asian descent as scapegoats. The tragic massacre in Atlanta this past March, where eight people were shot and killed, six of whom were women of Korean and Chinese descent, is the most visible instance of this form of scapegoating, combining our association with both disease and sex. This is symptomatic of trends across the country. One in four Asian American youth have experienced anti-Asian bullying since March, 2020. And over 3,800 incidents of anti-Asian hate have been recorded since then, with some estimating anti-Asian hate crimes rising by roughly 2,000%. And those are only the reported numbers. Other incidents include an elderly Filipino woman being kicked repeatedly while people watched and did nothing in Midtown Manhattan, a stabbing of a Burmese man and his two children in Texas, a man spraying an Asian person with Febreze in the New York subway, and innumerable and underreported instances of vandalism, spitting, stalking, and verbal harassment. Much of this violence has been aimed disproportionately at Asian American women. 
In the first two months of the lockdown, 60% of Asian Americans and 30% of all Americans polled reported to have witnessed anti-Asian bias. As a community, we have endured not only the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic, but we have also felt the pandemic of white supremacy that has been so clearly and overtly infecting the United States. But we continue to resist, survive, and heal. And today is about that healing. Now it is with great honor that I introduce our next guest, Ginger Klee. Ginger Klee, pronouns she, her, hers, is a queer, multi-ethnic Korean mental health therapist in her own private practice in Orange County, California, where she specializes in treating trauma and acculturative stress and treating the queer and trans, Black, Indigenous, and people of color communities. She treats adolescents, adults, and families. She is also an adjunct psychology professor where she teaches about the intersectionality of gender, sex, sexuality, and ethnicity. Welcome, Ginger. Hello, hello. Thank you so much for having me. I'm, it's an honor to be here. Um, I wish I was here under better circumstances. Um, you know, it just seems like things, new things, just tragic things keep happening every day. Um, and not just to the AAPI community. Um, but of course that's what my talk is going to focus on specifically. So let's get into it. I'm going to talk about how to heal and how to take care of ourselves from racialized trauma. The first step would be to identify what you're even healing from. And I know that may seem very simple, but there are so many nuances and layers to what we are all experiencing right now. And by first naming it, it allows you to actually fully feel and understand and talk with other people about what's going on. So racism, we all in a way know what this is, but it takes on many forms, big and small. And honestly, if you get into a comparison game with it, you're not actually helping yourself. Right? I'm very grateful to have not experienced a vicious hate crime. At the same time, it does not mean that my pain, your pain is not legitimate or valid. So I'm gonna focus on the fact that trauma and what makes something traumatic is all about your experience, your subjective experience. Just because it's not a, what we call in the EMDR therapy world, a big T trauma does not mean that it is not traumatic. If any situation that makes you feel unsafe, unwelcome, alone, hopeless, helpless, all of those experiences can be traumatic. They're overwhelming. Their cycle is going to be traumatizing to you. It's what we stereotypically would think of as traumatic being a victim of a physical vicious hate crime, being great with little t traumas. These are harder to identify, or what I, I like to actually refer to them as the microaggressions of trauma, because they have a lot in common. You're not quite sure if the person meant it. Um, you're not quite sure exactly what happened, what it is. Maybe someone calling you, oh, what city I'm from, right? It makes you question reality. And if it happens in a singular time, then it might not seem that bad. But if it happens over and over again, every day for your, the rest of your life, microaggressions add up. They become more and more powerful and drive you more and more crazy and make you feel more and more powerless. Because what do you do with microaggressions? How do you stand up for yourself? You can, get, you can end up being accused as playing the race card, being overly sensitive, right? Or you're gaslighted into thinking. It's a great example of how people dismiss your experience, your feelings. Gaslighting is something we generally refer to with an abusive relationship, particularly an emotionally and psychologically abusive one. It's when people question 
you and your experience. This uh, infographic on the right hand side is a great way, great example of racial gaslighting, right? Well, what I said, what I did isn't racist. Right? I'm not a racist person. I didn't mean it in a racist way, or it's just a joke. Why are you going to be so sensitive? Right? And all that does is dismiss your experience. And it's not them taking responsibility for what they're doing, for their ignorance, for their actions. And it makes you feel so small and like your feelings, your race doesn't matter. And microaggressions add up, right? Microaggressions contribute to prejudice, prejudicial attitudes. Those contribute to discriminatory actions and hate crimes. So if we really actually started to tackle more about microaggressions and those experiences, it could be preventative in terrible, terrible tragedies. Another piece we don't talk about enough is called acculturative stress. Now, this is different than a simulation. A simulation is something that um, we, we tend to use more often than, honestly, acculturative stress or acculturation is something I only hear about in textbooks, in research, and in the clinical world that I'm a part of. A simulation is completely changing yourself. I say an immigrant comes to the United States and they leave all of their cultural practices and values behind and they fully then assimilate into American culture. But that's not what most people do, especially Black, Indigenous, and people of color communities. We don't come here to erase where we came from. We come here and because we live in the United States, we are exposed to a new culture, new values, new traditions, and we can choose to, whether it's subconsciously or consciously, to adapt, to change, to take on some of this new culture. The longer we're exposed to it, the more likely it's going to happen. And there's nothing wrong with that per se, but it can be stressful because you can feel like you're compromising a part of yourself or disrespecting your ancestors and where you came from. And it can also make you feel like maybe I shouldn't be feeling so scared or maybe I feel, am I supposed to feel less like my identity because I've changed, because I've adapted some of these American cultures or white Eurocentric cultures. And that can bring up a lot of inner conflict I know that I experienced that. And yet, despite your acculturation, whatever level it is, it doesn't stop other people from seeing and treating you as you look. I do have the privilege of being racially ambiguous, so I am attacked less than my Korean, full Korean family members my full AAPI friends and family. That doesn't mean that I am not mistreated and that does not mean that I do not experience stress and trauma around this. And they don't see how much you've acculturated, right? When you're attacked, they don't see that and they don't care. And honestly, it shouldn't matter. How well, let's talk more about trauma, really. <laughs> it's one of my favorite topics, if you couldn't tell. So let's go on to the next slide if we can. We've all likely heard about PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. That's generally associated with someone who's in the military, right? a veteran. You do not need to be a veteran. You do not need to be in the military to have PTSD. PTSD is different than what we also call complex PTSD. PTSD is generally associated with a big T trauma, a life-threatening event that happened to you. CPTSD more so occurs with little T traumas or can it, it can occur from the combination of big T and little T traumas. And what makes complex PTSD more difficult, I mean, it's even in the name, right? It's more complicated. 
it's from traumas that happened again over time for weeks for months for years for most of your life and one feature that makes cptsd different than ptsd is what's called an emotional flashback when we generally hear about traumatic flashbacks and portrayals of media even we generally uh, know about auditory and visual flashbacks but emotional flashback is a feeling that's so much harder to identify. That's so much harder to identify as a flashback. Uh, you flashback to feeling like you're 12 years old, hiding in the closet, fear to speak out, fear to leave. Flashback to being belittled by family or fr supposed friends and bullies. and it can make you feel helpless and scared like you're a child all over again. And when we experience that, again, it's harder to identify because it's not so obvious, right? You're not seeing something, you're not hearing something. And so you just mistake it as being overwhelmed and only being overwhelmed or just being stressed because you're not able to accurately identify that it is an emotional flashback, it's going to be harder to be grounded, to get a hold of yourself. You can even feel childish because you're an adult suddenly feeling like a child again and you don't know why. We kind of overuse the word triggered nowadays, unfortunately, the whole hashtag triggered thing. But triggered, triggered is real. If you're experiencing an emotional flashback, you are triggered, you are traumatically triggered. And it makes it so much harder to respond versus react. To feel like you can regain control of yourself. So if you've ever felt like a situation is currently at a five, like a stressor, but you're responding in a at an eight, nine or 10, something else is going on. Now, it doesn't always have to be an emotional flashback. There's plenty of other things that contribute to us overreacting to something. But if you're constantly real feeling that way, constantly feeling emotionally reactive, start to ask yourself why. Or something I actually encourage my clients to do, how old do you feel right now? So that's a key difference between complex PTSD and PTSD. And for those of us who live with microaggressions and prejudice and racial battle fatigue, where you're just exhausted from all of the attacks and all of these things happening all of the time, you're more likely to experience complex PTSD symptoms. So what are some common symptoms between the two? Well, we can, as you just heard me say, you feel like you're constantly under attack. You constantly need to be alert. So that's what we call hypervigilance or hypoarousal. You're feeling on edge because you need, you feel like you need to be at the ready at all times. And that can lead to having an exaggerated startle response. You can go into, I'll talk more about the fight, flight, freeze, or fawn uh, in a couple of slides. So I'll get back to that in a second. But you can also end up numbing yourself. We're very good at distraction. That is the number one thing that people generally turn to nowadays, especially because of social media and our cell phones, right? Um, we want to disconnect because we don't want to feel because, is because it feels so overwhelming that if we feel like we focus on it, we're going to lose ourselves. We're not going to be able to come back, which is generally not true, but we're scared that's going to happen. Right? We feel like we just have to keep going. We have to keep pushing forward because if we don't, we're going to lose. We're going to lose something. We're going to lose this fight. Which is, but that also leads to not be able to regulate your emotions very well, right? Because you're not honoring them. You're not naming them. You're not allowing yourself. You're not making the time to feel them, to talk about them. And when we constantly experience these microaggressions, these prejudices, this <laughs> the never ending pour of bad news that has been 2020 and 2021. It's harder to pay attention, to remember things because your brain is literally overactive. 
which obviously is also going to negatively affect your sleep. Now, I'm not trying to make everyone think that they have complex PTSD, by the way, but many more, many of us have trauma that we don't realize. So even if you don't have complex PTSD, which hopefully most of you don't, you could still have trauma-like symptoms and could still benefit from working through trauma, naming it. By talking through what's going on, by working through your trauma now, it actually prevents it from becoming something like complex PTSD. So let's dive more into fight, flight, freeze, and fawn. Now, some of you might be a little surprised to hear that there are four Fs to this alliteration. Right? Most of us hear fight or flight, right? That's the most common phrase. When you are in a but sometimes we right, you're frozen or you feel silenced. Right? But fawn is when we don't talk about enough. And from how I have clients in the API community, I think that a lot of us go into fawn, which means because I am scared of you, because I don't want more trauma, because I don't want something worse to happen, I'm going to pretend I'm going to be more likely to be silent and just make it seem, particularly in the AAPI community, we do this. This goes along with the model minority myth, doesn't it? Oh no, we're we're a minority, but we're different, right? Uh, we're 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 better. We're not going to say anything about that. We're just going to let it slide so that maybe we can have a little bit more privilege. That's what fawning is fawning our attackers, our perpetrators, our oppressors. And that's a trauma response. It's a fear response that does not get enough recognition. I know that that's one of my main responses personally. And when you become, it is okay if that is your trauma. Right, it's worth noting how trauma changes the way your brain works. As you can see here on the top, all that is in the brain. Cortisol in a non-traumatized brain is going to have cortisol only in a in a, uh, in one part of your brain. Cortisol, by the way, is a stress hormone. We all experience it. Cortisol is helpful when you are in the for in a forest with a bear who's trying to attack you. Cortisol helps you run away faster. Helps you pay more attention to your senses. It helps keep you safe. Helps you react more quickly. Um, but we don't want too much cortisol. Cortisol is not good for you on both a mental health and physical health level. High levels of cortisol can actually increase um, hypertension, cardiovascular issues, etc. Uh, so what you see in the PTSD brain is cortisol is everywhere. It's not just in one part of the brain. And then on the bottom half, you'll see how much more active a PTSD brain is. Again, back to that hypervigilance. I need to be on edge. I need to always pay attention. That's why it's so hard to concentrate, to remember things, to sleep, to control your emotional responses. It's literally able to change you on the brain, what diagnoses you might have, what your resilience and support system look like. Uh, but so through therapy and through other healing, it can be better. Your brain scans. Here's the thing, heartbreaking, disgusting nauseating. We have, we're also dealing with, it's called intergenerational trauma. So you go to the next slide. Intergenerational trauma, for those of you who want to read more about it, actually, uh, there's an amazing book called uh, My Grandmother's Hands that talks about this. We are still healing from and working through trauma from our ancestors. It affects us in so many ways. Family patterns exist for a reason, the good and the bad. So unfortunately, mo many of us, most of our communities have experienced a, what's called historical trauma. You were hearing KT talk about the various types of trauma and oppressive events that have occurred for the AAPI community that affected the entire group 
at the same time, who also had less, at less access to resources because of that oppression, because of the prejudice and discriminatory policies that existed. That affects your, again, your brain. So if you have a traumatized brain and you're raising a child with your traumatized brain, it's gonna be a lot harder to raise a non-traumatized child, to be there for the child in a way that you would without a traumatized brain. But not only that, back to that core of, of experiencing certain health, operational trauma affects us both on a mental and physical level, unfortunately, because of that historical trauma. So even though you didn't, we didn't, many of us did not experience these historical events that were mentioned and still heal from them. It's one of the benefits of present day. We have a lot more knowledge about this. Again, we can name it, which gives us the opportunity to heal from it, to start to break those family patterns, to not to decrease passing these down from generation to generation. The next slide is just a quote uh, back to uh, my grandmother's hands. I'm a big fan of Resma Menegum. It's not your fault that this stuff happened to you, but it is your responsibility to do something about it now. When you accept extreme responsibility, it broadens your response ability. Back to the difference between responding versus reacting. And it can be frustrating because, you know, it's like, I don't want to just be the bigger person. I don't want to be the one who, I, you know, sometimes it can feel so sad what kind of spaces to do them in and with what kind of people. Because unfortunately, not all therapists will believe you and will validate you. That's hopefully we can uh, prevent as many people as possible from being in that kind of space. Um, so in the right kind of space, you are heard, you are validated, and you are able to talk about it. By doing so, you'll also have a therapist that can help you learn how to, again, respond, to ground yourself, to decrease your reactivity, to work through those traumatic memories and feelings, to work through that fight, flight, freezer, fawn energy that you experience. And hopefully start up. I know the Asian Mental Health Collective has, an, I believe, an AAPI support group for what's going on. They even have some for therapists, which I appreciate. I have a soapbox. Honestly, even the World Health Organization says that if you do have PTSD, that medications is not the number one recommended treatment for, for PTSD. But medications can be helpful. So one thing that a lot of people don't think about when they look for a therapist is to decide that they are not the right fit for you. Please, please, please do your best to empower and empower yourself to choose your therapist. Interview them. Ask for what's called a consultation. Some people offer at least 20 minutes for free. Ideally, for me, at least half hour, but ask them what makes them culturally competent. What is the work that they're doing to be anti-racist? Do they have experience working with your community or not? Right. Ask them those questions. If they will not answer them, they are not the right one for you. I personally left my therapist of seven years because of cultural competency. And yes, it took me seven years to realize it. <laughs> I'm not perfect. We did a lot of other good trauma work on other things. But then when it came to working on identity, being multi-ethnic, Korean, and queer in 2020, it was no longer the right fit for me. So I went through this journey myself just last year. So here are some websites that you can um, refer to to try to help you find the right fit. Because as you can see, there are um, not so much more than what's actually on this slide. There are so many diverse directories out there for a variety of communities. The next point is, might be a little bit hard to hear. There's a difference between surviving and healing, right? The whole title of this talk today is, is healing, right? Healing from hate. At the same time, some of us 
and we can heal maybe some minor wounds wounds heal here and there but as long as you are in active survival mode you're not really going to be able to heal doesn't mean you can't get prepared for it get some tools that will help you there get there but as long as you are again if you're in a, the forest and there's a bear still chasing you <laughs> You're not going to be able to do the deep trauma healing of feeling safe from the bear because the bear can still attack you. So there's good reason to not be healing yet from that. That's why you need, again, safe spaces, safe people to heal, to help you heal. If, as long as you're in a constant toxic, tra traumatizing environment, it's not going to happen. That's where a therapist and other people can help you survive till you get out of there. And then of course, we're talking about a systemic level of feeling unsafe. That's why so many of us are trying to fight to make the system safer and build systems of safety. We're trying a lot that way racism, you cannot self care away, homophobia, only tell you how to self and again, quote, I promise he didn't pay me to say all this. Um, so that's on the next slide. We need community. For those of us in an oppressed group, a minority group, we need community. Healing from white body supremacy begins with the body, your body. We cannot individualize that heals. That's exactly what is the Korean culture that I so much value and love. Being a family and not just blood family, chosen family, to heal with you, to fight with you, right? You know, uh, I don't, I'm not a performer, but I used to be in choir. And so collective healing, a metaphor I like to, to say with collective healing is it, when we're singing and performing in a choir, Sometimes you need to take a breath in a place you're not supposed to take a breath. Sometimes we need to breathe more. And of course, you don't want to affect the performance. So we do what's called staggered breathing. We take turns breathing together. You will burn out, you will collapse. So with the collective support, it allows us all to take a moment to breathe with people who I've had some clients who only started to really think about their identities just last year. To be frank, I didn't realize I could call myself a woman of color until clients started calling me a woman of color when I opened my practice. Because I was raised in a Eurocentric world. But that didn't stop the world from treating me differently. Even though I didn't realize exactly that's what was going on. So that reclaiming piece has been extremely important to me. All right, the next slide is just talking more about how to take care of ourselves. And it's also meant to emphasize how much we overuse distraction. We all know how to distract ourselves. We all, but the other two columns we so underutilize. Again, back to observing and and identifying how we feel, making time to feel the unpleasant emotions, to name them. Radically accept and hmm, mindfulness and self-awareness. Doing so, you can, since there isn't enough to, you heard me talk about a few times now, my grandmother's hands it can be traumatizing and how that can manifest into our lives and also other ways of healing. The Racial Healing Handbook is a bit of a self-help series that you can walk through, your, um, that can help you walk through your own racial healing. And then this is specifically actually um, written about uh, black slavery. However, post-traumatic slave syndrome, also a really great read that also touches on intergenerational trauma. I am building a resource page on my website. A lot of really wonderful 
opportunities for healing as well with what's called virtual urbanization of, you know, you don't have, just have to go to these websites. I recommend looking up some of these agencies and organizations also. They're not just a therapist directory. They will post and host talks and support groups for our community can be blown in this. You are not alone in this. There's a lot to throw at you in such a short time. Be brief and talk about this a little bit more. Lay it out, see PTSD or even PTSD and, and, and what, what we might encounter within ourselves as well as the, the resources that we might be able to find. So um, thank you so much. I, I was really, I have so many follow-up questions, but I was wondering um, if you could, at the very last slide, there was something about rest as resistance. And I think that you, your point about how you can't self-care away racism is like such a good one. Cause I think that people have been overusing the, the term self-care. Um, and oftentimes it's a, you know, it, it can be co-opted by people who just want to go to the spa, which is, there's nothing wrong with going to the spa. But um, I, I was wondering if you could speak a little bit more to, uh, to the role of rest recuperation um, as part of this responding versus reacting um, thing. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Part of the resistance piece of it is we feel like we have to keep going all the time, right? That whole, again, pull ourselves by, ups, by our bootstraps, um, 110%. And that is a white supremacist idea that if we just worked harder, we wouldn't be oppressed. We deserve rest just as much as anyone no matter our level of privileges or not. And by resting, it gives us the energy to push forward, to move forward, right? You know, I, again, I'm a big fan of metaphors. If you are gonna do a trail hike and you're gonna hike a hundred miles, if you don't stop and rest and sleep, eat, enjoy the view, hope for efficient, on empty. And I think so many of us, though, are experiencing this push to just to overwork ourselves, especially because of what's going on. We feel like we're we're bad um, for our community by not going to every protest or not, you know, staying up to date with every single current event that is happening. And again, it creates this this um, misleading idea that we're just not doing enough. We're not fighting hard enough which is why that rest as resistance is so important. Also, by resting, it also encourages and invites our white allies and accomplices to fight with us. I was actually just talking about this with a client yesterday. He was saying how he experienced a microaggression and wildly inappropriate question from a healthcare provider. And he, like many of us, just went into fawn and kind of annoyance and answered it and tried. It was like, you know what? I'm just too exhausted to deal with this. But his white partner was like, oh, hell no. And did, has sent numerous emails, has got, uh, spent hours on the phone to file a formal complaint. And now it's gone up and up the ladder all the way up to, I believe, the county level. And that's a perfect example of he rested because it was exhausting to experience that yet again of everything else. And his white ally accomplice is doing the fighting. Yeah. That's such a great example. Um, like let, in some ways, making space for ourselves can, can be an opportunity for the people around us who care about us to, to potentially step in or move in. Um, mm -hmm. I, I wanted to, to invite back uh, my illustrious colleagues 
and while we're 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 having them come back, I was there was some response in our chat to the the information you provided about generational people of the global majority to kind of recognize. Um, I know a lot of that research was also um, comes from studies of of Holocaust survivors and their children. But I was wondering if you could speak more. Uh, trauma can be passed on, and I think it's really important to people in our community. Oh, hello, doggy. <laughs> Okay. I do with Tina. Um, of we work with a lot of, um, of groups. World War II right now, we have a partnership with the camps. Program and for Torture. Are... Oh, so sorry. I think oh. it's a lag in there, isn't it? Yes, Go ahead, Leilani. I didn't realize. I think there's a lag in my. So, Leilani, go ahead. Okay. I can't hear Leslie. That's all. Let me know. Um, what was I saying? I was saying that, well, with the work that we do um, here at, at Tierra, this is um, something that, you know, we work, we try to work with counselors and, and talk about our work in theater. Um, when we first started working with Laotian refugees, we were, when we were creating Refugee Nation, um, we talked with a therapist and counselor at the very beginning because we were afraid that we would, um, you know, in our interviews, we didn't want to be responsible for triggering any PTSD responses. PTSD, they were, we just the thought of it started makes. I don't want to talk about. It. Great, uh, Leslie, uh, can go ahead and thank you so much, Leilani, for that. I think that a lot of us theater makers try to are uh, the communities we're trying to serve. So that's like it's it's very helpful to hear. Are you are you back with us, Leslie? I know you had I wanted so, to. Go ahead. Oh, thank you. Yeah, Haile, I'll go after you since I kind of cut out and came back. Please go first. Okay. Um, I I wanted to say thank you to Jim. allows us to, for me personally, to sit back and analyze. This is the first time that I heard about the four Fs. I always thought there was two Fs. Yeah. And, yeah. and as you were explaining fawning, I thought to myself, oh my God, that's what we were socialized to do as, as Hawaiians, right? We were, we were, you know, told to show aloha at all times and, and be, um, you know, docile. <laughs> yeah. And, and agreeable. Right. So I really appreciate what you shared there. Um, that that kind of opens up uh, just a whole line of thought that I need to go and process. <laughs> but I I I had a I wanted to ask us about you know being in uh, many of us work within predominantly white institutions, and there seems to be um, we seem to be held to a higher standard in some ways. And I was wondering if you had maybe one or two um, coping mechanisms or thoughts on that, on how to how to deal with um, being in those situations. Uh, being in the situations oh, in PWIs. In a PWI, yeah. Uh, I think one, it reminds me of, of community. If you have a PW, if you're in a PWI and you're surrounded mostly by people who don't understand your experience to find people, whether it's in person or virtual, who can validate what you're going through, to help you talk through what you're going through, to help you maybe sift through some of the gaslighting that might be happening at your PWI, but also to help you realize how much to take on. I know a lot of um, black indigenous and people of color are being asked to be on um, like diversity equity communities now more than ever because of 2020. Mm -hmm. And you do not have to do that, right? You do not have to take on that role just because of your identity. That's just, uh, to me, seems a bit placating or, um, the other word is kind of uh, escaping me at the moment, but um, making sure you have support. If it's not at your work, 
to have it somewhere else. Mm -hmm. um, it also can help you assess whether that's still the right fit for you, right? Or where does that fit in your life? How do you want it to fit in your life? What role do you want this PWI to be in your life? Um, I think is why it's so important to have people from an outside perspective with that. Mm. Mahalo, mahalo. Mm. Um, I guess I could go next. Uh, thank you. Yes, Ginger, mahalo for this incredible presentation. And KT, to have your presentation that set that up was really mm -hmm. powerful combination. Um, I guess about how we curate, I, I'm a stage director, so how I'm and an artistic director now, so I'm thinking about how I hold space. And I consider my own background as Yonsei, fourth generation Japanese American of a descendant of World War II concentration camp survivors and non-survivors, as well as knowing the history of like say, um, that the camps were built on the reservation Indian reservation system and everything that came, you know, with colonization and um, uh, white supremacy culture. So mm -hmm. I just think about all of those connections, my own relatives, and then holding space when I'm working to decolonize this theater I'm working at now. Gratefully, I have a staff that's on board and we're all navigating our own complex uh, identities, you know, it, it, intersections of identity and how we are together in this learning space, you know, it's complicated, but we carry so much with us as we're working to do the, to do the good work. You know, I just thought, how, any thoughts around that? That's a whole dissertation, I'm sure. But um, those are thoughts that I hold as I'm working and learning, you know. As you're talking about, looking at your family and, and where you come from, it makes me think of, you know, back to like, again, reclaiming your identity or, or naming what your family has gone through, which again, can be very painful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it can be a bittersweet experience. You know, one thing that uh, I was assigned to do in grad school was, was create what's called a family genogram, where you don't just create your family tree, you identify what your family's been through. Um, what were their strengths? It can help us not just see unhealthy family patterns or the historical trauma that we may have gone through, but also our resilience. What resilience has been passed down in our families? How, what, how did they take care of themselves? And could we also learn to bring some of that back? Mm. Mahalo, Domo, Thank you. That's powerful. I'm taking notes, I'll do that. <laughs> Speaking of taking notes, I've also been taking notes. Um, but something you just said, Ginger, has been, it's the idea of resilience. Um, mm -hmm. a, to me, I feel resilience to be kind of like a, a an energy and a power that I know that I can draw upon that um, in some ways, like, connects me to my community and connects me to my ancestors. Uh, and I also have heard a lot of people talk about how resilience can sometimes be a synonym for, you know, just taking it and letting, <laughs> letting the, the racism, et cetera, happen. Um, I'm wondering if you can, speak to how one can kind of determine, and, and also to, to Haile's, the fawn, that was new to me too. And like, I immediately kind of was like, oh, that's such a, um, like an immigrant response in a lot of ways. That's like my mother's response to racism is to fawn. And so um, uh, the, the resilience and fawning, how do we tell the difference, I guess, is a, is a question I have. That's a great question. I, I think for one, it would be like, what am I doing this for? Who am I doing this for? Am I, am I not taking on this like battle? Like back to that client who 
kind of d- did go into fawn to a degree with them, the health professional, you know, is he doing that for himself or is he doing that for the sake of the person? Mm-hmm. Am, I, am I not saying anything to avoid a fight because I'm exhausted and I need the rest or because I feel like I have to, because it's the polite mm-hmm. thing to do. And also, even though he did stay silent in that moment, he didn't stay silent afterwards. He named it and shared it with someone else. He didn't tell them that they should go and do what they did, but he still named and honored the experience, called it for what it was. And, you know, other people can help us determine whether to fight or not, right? Because he has that support system, he was able to, in a way, delegate it to someone else. Um, Also, give ourselves permission to not take on every battle. That can be a form of resilience too. That is one of the hard things about, especially microaggressions, that whole damned if you do, damned if you don't idea, right? Well, if I stand up for myself, it's gonna be me giving them my mental and emotional energy and that emotional labor. But if I don't say something, I'm gonna shame and be mad at myself for not doing so. It doesn't always have to be those either two options. Give yourself permission to not have to educate every single person who, you know, it is a microaggression or is prejudicial to you. Mm-hmm. You don't have to, it's not, it's not for them. It's not always for them. You can start to do, uh, again, not resisting or not fighting for yourself because we can't do every single battle. It's impossible. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's very good advice. <laughs> Thank you for that. Leilani, did you want to go ahead and? Um, I, I'm, I feel like I've just been to therapy myself. <laughs> you saw right through me, Ginger. I'm like, I feel naked. Um, <laughs> um, and I'm looking at my this group of colleagues and leaders and um, I know that I personally need to do more work with my own my own healing. And yet at the same time, I ask, what are some thoughts we can take as leaders um, around how can we help our community heal and create, um, move, you know, I think that's now that we're launching that series, that's a question that we're asking ourselves and, and maybe there's some thoughts you have for us um, to think about. I, I mean, thinking about what you were just talking about and how KT, you said it was a like sort of fawn is an immigrant response. And Haile, you were talking about how Kanakuma Oli also have fawn as a response mm-hmm. in a different way. And and we have seen so much in Hawaii of that then imploding on each other. You know, we're under this API heading. Um, mm-hmm. and yet we're trying to bring a community together that oftentimes mm-hmm. We are in proximity to each other, so we're taking out this on each other. And mm-hmm. and I find myself, if I'll speak for myself, I find myself in the middle of all of that and loving this whole community, but knowing that we do harm to each other. And and I keep asking myself, what can we do to help create more understanding? For me, it makes me think of being willing to be vulnerable, right? As you all were just, some of you all have already done, you're already talk, talking and identifying like, yeah, I relate to that fawn experience. That way, by being someone who starts the conversation, it invites other people to join in. It, it helps other people feel a little less scared, a little less reserved uh, to start their own healing process. That's why more and more people sharing their stories, even if it's brief, can help draw other people in. I've had some clients who didn't realize that they were victims of prejudice or microaggressions until I named it for them. We need people to, again, name it, to talk about it, even though it's scary and vulnerable. Hmm. And thank you, Leilani, for bringing that up because um, 
we we work under such a very wide umbrella uh, mm. here at Kata, and um, the 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 ways that we ma- we are we manage that can sometimes be complicated by our own internal white supremacies, I think, um, which I feel like bringing that up towards the end of this episode may be a can of worms, but um, the, the the healing that we need to do, we need to commit to doing together. Uh, and I think that that, that is, takes so much intense, trust and and generosity um you know within this umbrella for kata and then also uh amongst uh, bipoc people of color communities um so this is this like you you were talking about ginger how you can't heal if you're surviving and i think that our healing with each other needs to you know be there's something about parallel healing that I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if you have anything to say to um, trying to heal with others, uh, like, and how how that. What are some strategies worse initially? Because I, especially the more people who witness it, the more powerful the feeling will likely be. And we we. I think we, well, in a way, our brains almost are instinctually trained to want to veer away from that because, again, that feels almost life threatening. And yet, again, that is exactly and precisely what will help us heal. By Because it helps us externalize it. And the more people that witness it, um, not to say that you should like go on a grand stage or anything, <laughs> um, but by having more people witness it, 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 it makes it more real and valid. Um, one of the reasons why trauma becomes PTSD or can become PTSD is because we're just keeping it all in. It becomes a secret, a toxic secret that just spreads like the virus. Uh, uh, for myself, um, me and a few of my colleagues started an API therapist group for ourselves. It didn't exist. And so we created it. Uh, we meet once a month, and it's been w- one of the main things that's helped me survive and begin a healing process for th- with what's been going on this last year. So if you can't find it, then you can start small and just find one or two people here and there to bring together. Yeah, it seems critical, especially right now, not that we haven't had other times in history, um, but I know we're we're getting on in time, but I just want to mark that we're at a time when we're working and we know we need to heal. Thank you for being here, Ginger. While there's still attack or violence still going on, it's like it's all happening at once. So this has been, this is so critical that we're, that you're here with us offering this important information and some strategies going forward. Yeah, my pleasure. I'm so happy to be able to share the information with you all. Mahalo Anui. Thank yeah. you for being with us. Mm-hmm. We've had our group therapy, it feels like. Hello. And KT, any last thoughts? I know you had your presentation, the, the two of you. Oh, I guess we're transitioning. Okay, beautiful. <laughs> Well, once again, um, uh, you can find this PowerPoint that Ginger shared with us at www.gingerclee.com. And Ginger is offering our tradition. And of course, the Queen Lily Ukulani Trust and University of Hawaii Manoa. Thank you so much. Um, I also want to share that Kata has been in community with many signatories. And uh, we issued a statement that first week or so after the Atlanta shootings. Uh, But I also want to share that this coming Friday, the one month anniversary, that's April 16th, of the Atlanta shootings, 
be sure to visit the Kata Facebook page and kata.net, our actual website. Uh, there you can read another statement that we will issue. You can certainly become a signatory and fill out a Google form there as well if you want to be in support. And this statement is basically a call to action, a call for justice from the Asian American Pacific Islander Pacific Theater leaders. And we are also calling, of course, for an end to deadly white supremacy now. Statement, if you'd like. Be May Chaldez. Dax is a practitioner from iHollaback.org. And uh, another wonderful presentation around bystander upstander training. Uh, some learning from, uh, you know, from Ginger here. Uh, is centered in the body as well. So this series is working to bring forward our collective healing, our collective action, healing centered in our bodies to work together in solidarity. Um, with that, I'd also like to um, say mahalo to our incredible team off screen, Ariel Estrada and Maximiliana, Uru's, uh, Uru's uh, Meds, um, you know, programming for Kata that we hope of course, serves our community. That's our intention. And um, it's tax, de tax deductible. Thank you very much for that skew. And as you can see, we work in solidarity uh, with Black Lives Matters. We'd also like to uh, share with you that you can become a member of Kata as well. So you can go to our website and find out um, about our perks. And there's a skew right here as well on screen. Welcome to, to check us out that way. Also, I just want to give another big shout out to um, Haile and Leilani. Thank you for that beautiful, elegant transition um, uh, from the Return to the Source series to this series. But that doesn't mean ComFest isn't coming. ComFest is coming. And that will be May 2022 in Hawaii. Please be sure to make your plans to be with us. We have that advance notice or continued advance notice. So we are really excited when we can get back together. So that means please hang in there, check in with each other. As we mentioned, break your isolation, reach out and be safe, be healthy, continue to wear masks, socially distance, and please get vaccinated in order for us to get back to live theater and to be in community together again. So with that, mahalo, mahalo anui more soon and please again stay safe that i'm way up way up hey think i'm understand me that i'm way up way up uh way up way up uh way up way up hey think i'm understand me that i'm way up way up uh Make them understand me that I'm way up, way up, ayy. Make them understand me that I'm way up, way up, ah, uh, way up, way up.